Hello. Um, welcome, everyone, to Bard College's Globalization and International Affairs program here in New York City. Uh, my name is Jonathan Crystal. I'm the director of the program. Um, as is customary, I should ask you to take a moment to silence your cell phones uh, before we get started. Um, our program was founded by the late James Chase, and tonight's event, Russia and the Communist Past, is part of our James Clark Chase Memorial Speaker Series. Uh, this series is co-sponsored by Foreign Affairs Magazine, which you can find in the back of the room over there. Uh, Bard's Globalization and International Affairs program brings students from colleges and universities around the world to Manhattan, where they intern in international organizations during the day and study international affairs with leading scholars and practitioners in the evening. Uh, you can find out more about the program at www.bard.edu slash BGIA. Uh, tonight, it's my pleasure to introduce David Satter, who is speaking about his new book. I have it here. It was a long time ago, and it never happened anyway, Russia and the Communist Past. Uh, you can order it on the forms in the back of the room. I see people pick them up when they came in. Uh, this is his third book about Russia, uh, Age of Delirium, The Decline and Fall of the Soviet Union, and Darkness at Dawn, The Rise of the Russian Criminal State are the other two, uh, all of which are on Yale University Press now. Uh, Mr. Satter is a senior fellow at the Hudson Institute and teaches at the Johns Hopkins School of uh, Advanced International Studies, among a wide variety of other affiliations. Uh, he's had a long career as a reporter focusing on the Soviet Union and now Russia, uh, and has written for an extraordinarily wide variety of publications, really from all across the political spectrum. Uh, way too many to list here. It would take, I think, the whole night. Uh, it's a particularly long biography. So, um, this is the first event of the semester, so a bit about the format. Um, Mr. Satter will speak for 25 to 35 minutes, which I don't enforce rigorously. Um, and then we'll open the floor to questions, which I will moderate. Uh, before we begin tonight, I just want to take a moment to uh, thank a former faculty member of ours, Andy Nagorski, uh, who is the Vice President and Director of Public Policy at the East West Institute, for putting me in touch with David Satter. Um, and uh, Mia McCutley and Rachel Manning, who help organize all of our events here um, in the program. And with that, I turn the floor over to David Satter. Thank you, Jonathan. And uh, thank you all for coming. I'm very glad to be here. I uh, often uh, come to New York, but this is the first time I've uh, uh, spoken to a BARD uh, event, or f spoken before a BARD event. I hope it won't be the last time. The, the book that I've written and uh, that I want to discuss is the culmination, actually, of years of thinking about a problem that bothered me even before I ever set foot in Russia and bothers people to this day in the West often to very little resu result, which is what is it exactly that distinguishes Russia from the West? Why is it so difficult for, Russia, for Americans and other Westerners often to understand what goes on there? Napoleon said that there are actually only two countries in Europe. There's Russia and everyone else. And I think that the distinction, which he so accurately uh, uh, noted, is really the distinction between two different ways of looking at the individual human being. In the United States, in the West, in the countries of, uh, th of the world that are under Western influence, for better or worse, the individual is understood as an end in himself. He can't be used for just any purpose. Whereas in Russia, the psychology is that the individual is the means to an end. What this means for the history of Russia is that millions of people can be sacrificed and, uh, for political ends, and their deaths can be very little noted. The, if, uh, the lessons of mass atrocities can be overlooked, and they can continue uh, to influence the political situation in the country in one generation after another. I remember when I was uh, a correspondent uh, in the Soviet Union, a friend of mine came back 
uh, after uh, being completely unnerved by something he had seen. He was driving along outside of Moscow on the ring road, and he was watching as a plane came in for a landing at one of the airports. I guess it was Sharmetova. And as it approached, uh, he saw smoke coming out of one of the propellers, one of the engines. And then the engine caught fire, and then the plane exploded, fireball. But actually, that wasn't the frightening thing. The frightening thing was, and this was during the Soviet, the, the, at the heart of the Brezhnev era, when I was the Financial t Times correspondent in Moscow, what was really frightening was what happened next. Uh, there were no sirens. There was nothing on the radio, nothing on the TV. There were no roadblocks. There was no change of any kind. It was, and he was, he was very close to the airport. It was as if absolutely nothing had happened. In other words, it was more important to keep silent than it was to do something about the crash, to notify those whose relatives might have been involved, to see if there was any slim chance of aiding a survivor. None of that was important. So, so the life of the society went on as if nothing had happened. Later on, I was intrigued and horrified by the extent to which people in Russia disappear. Now, of course, in the West, or in the United States, if somebody disappears, uh, especially if it's a child, this is a cause of, there's a general alarm. It's a cause for, uh, for panic and extraordinary measures to try to locate the person. But in Russia, thousands of people disappear without a trace, and they do so every year. In the, in the first years of the Yeltsin era reforms, a strange thing happened in the country. The state assigned departments, many of them shabby and in not very good condition, suddenly be began to be worth money. And the elderly, alcoholic, infirm, mentally ill in some cases residents of, s of Russian apartments, which suddenly had value, began to disappear. And oftentimes they were found in the forests, especially after the snow melted. Sometimes they were even found on garbage heaps. Uh, and it was discovered that, the apart that somehow or the other, they had signed over their apartments to mysterious companies, which now began to possess h hundreds of these apartments and to make huge amounts of money off of them. What was uh, this criminal conspiracy was only possible, and it, and it existed in virtually every major Russian city, and it was uh, a sign of the times. I remember in Moscow walking along and seeing an absolutely blood-chilling notice attached to a bulletin board in the area where I was living, and it said, uh, do you need, are you sick, ill, do you need help? Uh, we will... Uh, pay your rent and take care of you uh, on condition that the apartment is signed over to us. Uh, uh, you know, as that, that, that in your will. Uh, of course, it was clear to me that anyone agreeing to that arrangement uh, would find that their will was being executed very quickly. And, and, and such was the case. And yet, during all the years that this, that this apartment racket was going on, very few, if any, steps were taken by the authorities to do anything about it. But the incident that actually typified the situation more than any other for me uh, was the one that I used to introduce the book. And this was the story of a young billiards player who got who had too much to drink one night and who ended up in a dumpster. Now, w he was put there either by people who had knocked him unconscious and uh, robbed him uh, or as a practical joke uh, or because he collapsed and uh, lost consciousness and uh, someone thought that uh, someone was angry at him. It's hard. No, we'll never know the reasons why. 
But the dumpster was picked up by a garbage grinding truck.